Good morning, ABF family and friends. We are so excited to just go before the Lord with you today. We want to welcome you to our online service. Hallelujah. So if you are clicking in for the very first time, we welcome you today. I pray that you are blessed by the worship and the word. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and just go right in and begin to just love and worship on our amazing God. So we're just going to sing the word today and we're going to say that we're going to write them on the tablets of our hearts. Hallelujah. Woo. Write them on the
We can count it all joy because we know that you hold our world in your hands. So we just want to worship you and honor you today, oh Father. We want to just give our lives to you, oh God, saying how you are worthy of every praise. You are worthy of every breath. You are worthy of every song we could ever sing because we don't live this life for us. Father, we live this life for you. So we just want to worship you today. So right where you are, I want you to just go before him today and say, Father, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Hallelujah. So come on, let's lift it up and sing Jesus.
gracious. You've been so faithful. And we just came to say thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you've been so good. Oh, and I thank you. If you have a grateful heart, come on and lift it up and sing, Lord. just take a moment and look back over your life and see all the things that he's done for you. You can't help but say, Father, you've been so good.
in our lives. Be glorified when we go to work. Be glorified when we raise our children. Be glorified in everything that we do. Be glorified. Be glorified. God, everything that we do, it's unto you, God. Let everything that we do be unto you, God. And let it be holy and acceptable to you, God. Everything we do is a symbol of worship, God. When we give, it's a symbol of worship. When we work, it's a symbol of worship. When we serve in the local church, it's a symbol of worship, God. Oh, be glorified in our lives. Be glorified, be glorified. Oh, oh thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us this time, God, to assess ourselves in our lives, God, and really question whether or not we're glorifying you in our lives. God, you set us down for a reason, God. Let us not use this time in vain. Search yourselves, church. Search yourself. The time is near. Search yourself. Oh, come on, people. We have to search ourselves. God, anything that is not like you, God, take it out of us. We just want to be more like you. We want to be closer to you, God. Take it out. Take it out. We don't want it. We don't want it. That secret sin, our favorite sin, we don't want it. Take it out. It's going to hurt, but take it out. We're going to lose friends. We're going to lose family. But take it out. Take it out in the name of Jesus. Search us, God. Search us, God. Every crook, every cranny, God. Search us, God. Let us not lose this time in vain, God. Let's, it's time for us to get our houses in order. The time is near. What bigger sign do you need than this? He shut down the whole world. This is just short of a flood. What more do you need? The time is now. Search yourselves. Search yourselves. God, cleanse us. God, God we give you glory. We give you glory, God. Help us to glorify you in our lives, God. Show us how to do it in your word, God, as we seek you and we seek your face, God. We thank you for honoring us with your presence. We thank you for being with us throughout the week, God. We thank you for the anointed word that is about to go forth. We thank you for this man of God that is about to bless us with the word that you have imparted in his heart. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We came here today to just declare that you don't have a need to worry. You don't have a need to fret. It is going to get better. We told you that last week, and it was so good that we have to tell it to you again that weeping may endure for our night, but joy will come in the morning. It's going to get better. Hallelujah. So let's lift it up today. Come on.
Good morning and welcome to another blessed Sunday morning here at Above and Beyond Fellowship. Hey, despite what's going on around the world, we are blessed to be able to enjoy praise and worship right here and to stream the good news of the gospel straight to your homes. This morning, uh, we continue the series that Pastor Lindsay started a few weeks ago called Standing Tall in Tough Times. My message today is called do the right thing. Let me first of all thank Pastor Lindsay for the opportunity to stand before you and to be used by God to bring today's message. Before I start, I want to use this video clip from the movie Courageous to set the tone for my message today. Mr. Martinez, have a seat. Thank you, sir. You've been very productive your first month here. You did good work. I'm very grateful to be here. Well, Mr. Martinez, the reason I called you in here is that I'm looking for an additional manager to oversee inventory and shipping. It carries more responsibility, but it pays more. Sound like something you might be interested in? Yes, I would. But before I make my final decision, I'd like for you to work a shift in that department next week. You'll see a list of 17 crates coming in on this sheet. But one of those crates will be going to a separate warehouse. Mr. Martinez, when you report the inventory, I'd like for you to report that we received 16 crates. 17 are coming in. But you want me to write down 16? Yes, that's right. I have another purpose for the extra crate. You are on my team, right? Because I really can't use people who aren't on my team. Tell you what. You think about it tonight and give me your answer in the morning. Make it 10 o'clock. 
But I'll need to know if you really want this job. Good evening, sir. Javi, we need this job. For the first time in a year, we're able to pay the bills. No, Carmen, but he made it very clear. If I was not a team player, he did not want me there. Maybe it's not wrong. It just looks that way. He's the owner of the factory. He asked me to write down false information, Carmen. He asked me to lie. When do you have to give him an answer? Ten o'clock. Javi, if he lets you go, promise me that you will call me. If you don't, then I know everything is okay. Javi, I don't want us to go back. Good morning, sir. Morning, Mr. Martinez. How are you this morning? Fine, thank you. How are you? I don't know yet. Please, have a seat. I trust you've had time to think about our conversation yesterday. Yes, sir, I did. And what did you decide? Are you on my team? Mr. Tyson, I am very grateful to have a job here. I cannot do as you have asked. And why is that? Because it is wrong, sir. And it would be dishonoring to my God and my family to lie on that report. Do you understand what this may do to your job here? Yes, sir, I do. Javier, may I shake your hand? Young man, you just gave me the right answer. I've been looking for someone to manage inventory and shipping, and quite frankly, you were the last person on my list. But I need somebody I can trust. Will you take the job? We'll adjust your pay. I would be honored to, sir. Good. Then the job is yours. Now, Walter will go over all the specifics with you, and I'll make the announcement to the staff on Monday. Congratulations, Javier. Oh, and Javier, thanks for your integrity. It's rare. Well done, Javier. After six times, I was getting discouraged. So what would you do in that situation? Would you have chosen be a team player for the company, falsify documents? Or would you be brave enough like Harvey Martinez and tell your boss it's not right, that it, you do not want to dishonor God and your family? It's a daily challenge for Christians to stay faithfully devoted to God in a world that is constantly trying to get us to compromise. My presentation today would be a little different in that there is no one passage of scripture, but I'll use the stories of a few Bible characters to illustrate that even though they were facing death, they stood tall in tough times and did the right thing. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, I stand before you because you permitted. For that I give you all the praise, honor, and the glory. I acknowledge your presence here in this room, Lord, and I ask that you saturate it with your Holy Spirit. I ask that your glory fill this place and it softens our heart so that we are receptive to your word today. I stand here as an empty vessel. Fill me with your word. Edify your church today, Lord, so that after we hear this message, we would go into the world equipped to 
do the right thing, to stand tall in tough times. This I ask in the Christ of the Lord. Amen. In life, we are faced with many challenges. Some are small and some are monumental. But in the end, if we do the right thing, we can successfully overcome those challenges even in a tough season. But doing the right thing is not always that simple. You must have some core principles that guide you to make your decisions. You may know the right thing to do. The hard part is doing it. Doing the right thing for these Bible characters I'm about to present may not have been easy at the time. First of all, they were all captives in a strange land. And their decision to go against the status quo meant certain death. But their commitment to serving Almighty God guided their decision to do the right thing. Let me ask you this. Do you always do the right thing when no one is watching? What would you do if nobody would ever find out? Do you bring home office stationery for your personal use? Do you falsify information in your annual income tax report to get more money in your returns? Tell me, what would you do if the cashier at the grocery accidentally gives you more money than they should have? Do you pocket the extra change or do you give it back? Sometimes I use the self-checkout to get cash back at the grocery. And many times I left without picking up my cash. I'm probably sure whoever came after me was probably saying that the cash was a blessing. Now perhaps it was, but you know what? No one ever came running after me saying, hey, you left your cash. These insignificant events reveal one's character and more importantly, one's integrity. C.S. Lewis says, integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching. Standing tall in this world is not easy. And we all need to be on our guard because there are so many things in our world today that would test our faith. Let's look at our first biblical character. It's from the book of Esther. Now, while Esther gets credit for saving the Jewish people from annihilation, I believe apart from her strong faith, the upbringing by her older cousin, Mordecai, and his stern words to her may have encouraged her to stand tall in the tough time that she was facing. So let me paint the picture that led up to Esther being so daring. Esther lived in Persia about 100 years after the Babylonian captivity. When her parents died, she was adopted and raised by her older cousin, Mordecai, who was also a leader in the Jewish community while they were in exile. Now, one day, the king of Persia, Xerxes I, he threw a six-month celebration, a real big party. And if you think that was big, at the end of that, he threw a seven-day open bar feast. Now, on the seventh day, he decides that he wants to show off his wife, Queen Vashti, to his guests. Now, Queen Vashti was having none of that. She was not about to parade herself before a bunch of drunk men. King Xerxes was furious, and he went into a huddle with his council. They decided that they should get rid of Queen Vashti. To find a new queen, Xerxes hosted one of the first bachelorette reality shows. 
some of the finest young ladies in the kingdom, including your Esther, got rounded up and were put into the king's harem to be groomed before they were interviewed by the king. When it was Esther's time to be interviewed, Mordecai, her cousin, told her, do not reveal your race. Do not let them know that you are a Jew. In the end, she won the royal beauty contest, and that is how Esther, a Jew, became the queen of Persia. Soon after she became the queen, Mordecai learns of a plan to eliminate the Jews. This was spearheaded by a top Babylonian official called Haman. He hated Mordecai because Mordecai had refused to bow to him whenever he was walking through the city. Mordecai sent word to Esther saying, listen, you need to talk to the king to stop this genocide of the Jews. This was a tough time that Esther faced. She sends a message back to Mordecai saying, listen, I just can't go to the king and speak to him because no one approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned. And the king hasn't called me for the last 30 days. Mordecai then challenges Esther with these famous words. If you turn to Esther chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, this is what he tells her. Don't think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, he tells her, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come and arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. Now this must have struck a nerve in Esther because she immediately, immediately accepts the challenge which could mean her death by responding and saying, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, this is what she says. I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This statement and attitude changed everything for the Jews. Because Esther then had her audience with the king. And Haman was executed on the very same gallows he had built for Mordecai. Now I'll stop here as many of you know the rest of the story. And if you don't, I urge you to read the book of Esther. It's only 10 chapters long, but it also reads like a great novel. So what can we learn from Esther who was facing a tough time? Number one, spiritual upbringing by parents and guardians set the foundation for us to do the right thing. You see, Mordecai was a leader in the Jewish community. And he also raised Esther in the faith. So he was more than her guardian. He was like a spiritual advisor to her. And his words persuaded Esther to act on her faith. And to speak to the king at a time when the Jewish people needed someone to go to the king on their behalf. Point number two from Esther. Prayer and fasting will equip us to thrive and be victorious in tough times. What did, what did she do? She said she was going to pray and fast with her eunuchs and servants. But the entire Jewish community fasted and prayed for their deliverance with her. If you don't know it, there's spiritual power in numbers. Because Matthew 18 verse 20 says, For where two or three 
gather in my name, there I am with them. Point three from this lesson from Esther. Surrendering to God gives God free reign to work on our behalf. In the end, God alone gets the glory. Esther knew that she needed help to face the king without an invitation. So she sought God through prayer and fasting and surrendered herself to God for the safety of her nation. Nothing pleases our Heavenly Father more than knowing that his children are surrendering themselves to him. Our next character that I'm going to use in today's message is Joseph. We know the story of Joseph being sold into slavery uh, by his brothers and how he ends up working for a rich Egyptian. And he also spends time in jail and he receives the gifts of interpreting dreams. But I want to focus on one incident in Joseph's life where he stood tall and resisted temptation. Joseph's boss, Potiphar, is on a business trip and he leaves Joseph to run things in his absence. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. His master's wife liked what she saw and tried to get Joseph to sleep with her. Let's go to Genesis chapter 39, verses 8 to 15. And this is Joseph speaking after he's approached by his master's wife. He says, he's refusing. He says, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her, even be around her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and he had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has brought to us, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak behind and he ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. We know the rest of the story. Potiphar comes home and he sends Joseph to jail where he faces more tough times, but Joseph eventually becomes the prime minister of Egypt and he saves the nation and his entire family. Here's the point that we can learn from Joseph's life story. Live for an audience of one, that is God. Every time I read this passage or think about Joseph, I always reflect on the phrase by Joseph where he says, how can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. It was not his boss, Potiphar, that he was concerned about or scared about. It was God. For Joseph, the most important thing was knowing that committing adultery with Potiphar's wife was wicked and it was a sin against God. If he had slept with Potiphar's wife, that could have been their secret. But God would have known. And Joseph knew he could not live with himself knowing that he had sinned against God. That's the type of attitude we need to have 
in our daily lives. Putting God first so that when we are tested, our actions will please God and not man. We learn another valuable lesson from Joseph's action. And this is to flee from all temptation. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6 and 18 tells us, Flee from all sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside their body. But whoever sex sins sexually sins against their own body. When we give in to temptation, it makes us stay. We don't flee. We stay. And that's the problem. We need to put some distance between ourselves and the temptation or it will cost us dearly. King David made that mistake. He stayed instead of fleeing. When he saw Bathsheba bathing, he stayed. David should have looked away, but he stayed, and he stared. And we know the rest of the story. David ends up sleeping with Bathsheba, she gets pregnant, and David had Bathsheba's husband send to the front lines of the battle where he died. All because he didn't flee initially from temptation. Here's the thing about being tempted by sin. The late Ravi Zachariah said, Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. I recently read about Billy Graham the great evangelist, he had some rules when he traveled around the world. One of them was never to be alone in the company of another woman that was not his wife. And he had another, another rule. Never have the pay-per-view activated in his hotel room. He did something that we all need to consider, which is setting up predetermined boundaries. We need to decide ahead of time what we will do so that when life's temptations come our way, we will not be caught off guard. Because you know what? The devil is always up to something trying to trip us up. But the great news is that God always gives us a way out of temptation. It's in the disciples' prayer when we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God has the power to control the tempter, to control the devil, when we pray and ask him to save us. Giving into temptation is playing into the hands of the devil, whose plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, we may have fun while giving into temptation, but it comes with a price. It's going to cost you. And are you willing to pay? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Thank God that he will never leave us or forsake us. He always has a way out in times of temptation. And all we need to do is to put our eyes on Jesus and run towards him. Our final Bible character we can learn from today in standing tall through tough times is Daniel. After the Babylonians 
conquered Israel, they took many of its young promising men into captivity. As captives, David, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were chosen because they were from the royal family and the upper class. They were young men, as the Bible says, without physical defect. They were handsome and smart without, with qualifications to serve in the king's palace. Their Jewish names were changed, and for three years, they were taught the language and literature of the Babylonians. After that, they would enter into the king's service. So in other words, for three years, they had a full scholarship to study political science and public administration. But they were devout followers of God, living in a world of ungodly influences. But their obedience to God was rewarded in amazing ways every time. So Daniel is now about 20 years old. Okay? So let's look at the first incident that Daniel and his friends faced immediately after they were captured and given the best food from the king's table to eat. So we're going to go to uh, Daniel. First Daniel. Verse 8 to 15. Verse 8 says, Daniel resolved, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test your servant for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now with the blessings from God, they entered into the king's service, King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king found them all 10 times better better qualified than all the magicians and enchanters in the entire kingdom. So what do we learn from Daniel here? Why did he choose not to eat the king's food? This is the first thing we learn from Daniel. Don't compromise when it comes to serving God. Don't go along just to get along. Stand up even if it means standing out. Verse 8 tells us that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. The food probably didn't meet the strict Jewish standards. It was not kosher. So Daniel didn't want to defile his body. And what does Paul tell us in Corinthians? He said that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Just like Joseph, Daniel's attitude was one of pleasing God and putting God first, no matter what or where he was. So he refused the barbecue chicken, the baby back ribs, and the sangria for a plain vegan diet. Daniel was faithful to God and refused to defile his body which, as Paul reminds us, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. One final example. I know you know all these stories, but stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. In chapter 6, yes, in chapter 6 of the book of Daniel, we see Daniel 
has been promoted to one of three administrators over 120 provincial governors in the Persian Empire. Now at this time, Daniel is about 80 years old. So you can see how long he was consistently serving the Lord without compromise. Daniel's public life was the same as his private life. The same Daniel they saw praying openly at home was the same person that worked. He worked as if he was working for the Lord. The other leaders tried to find grounds to bring charges against Daniel. But they could find no fault in his work. The Bible says that Daniel was not corrupt and he wasn't negligent. So the other administrators decided, look, we're going to use his faith against him. So they tricked King Darius into passing a 30-day decree which says, if anyone prays to another god or man other than the king, he will be thrown into the land's den. When Daniel heard this, he did not change his habit. He just did like he did all his life. He went home. He knelt facing Jerusalem three times a day and prayed to God. The other administrators knew that bringing evidence against Daniel to the king would have him killed. So let's take up the story in Daniel 6 verse 13. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles of Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to, the, to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edit that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Again, this is another popular Bible story, and we all, we all know how it ends. Daniel spends the night in the lion's den, and he is not eaten alive. This brings me to the second point about Daniel's story. God rewards faithfulness. God wants to see us totally devoted to him, giving him our all, being obedient and surrendering to him. When we do that, some of our prayers, believe it or not, could be answered immediately. And let me prove it. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel after one of his many prayers. Gabriel says in Daniel 9, 23, this is Gabriel talking. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out. Get this. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to to tell you, you are greatly beloved. That's a wonderful thing to know that God would answer your prayer immediately. Now, let me give you some tools for tough times. You know, as followers of Christ, we are not protected from challenges. Tough times will find our address and they will show up unannounced. Esther, Joseph, Daniel, and many others possessed qualities that demonstrated total loyalty to God and his plan. They were faithful, they were uncompromising, and they had a devoted prayer life, especially when they were facing difficulties. But our merciful God rewards faithfulness. When we surrender to him and decide that no matter what comes our way, we will not forsake him, 
then he is faithful and rewards us richly. Here are my points for home. What I like to call spiritual tools for tough times. Set some predetermined boundaries in your life so that when you're tempted, you know what to do. When you get that phone call, 10 o'clock in the night on the weekend, he wants to come over, you know what to do. Point number two, spiritual upbringing by parents and guardians help us set the foundation to do the right thing. It's important for parents, the elders and guardians to teach the young ones, to prepare them because they will fall. And because we know better, we need to train them like Mordecai, Mordecai did with his, with his cousin. He trained her so that when he spoke to her, she realized that this was her calling and she acted on it. Next point, prayer and fasting will equip us to thrive and be victorious in tough times. Over and over again, submit to God. Pray and fast. And the one I like the most is flee from all temptations. You see a trap, run. She calls you and she's not yours, run. Flee from all temptations. Next point is surrendering to God gives God free reign to work on your behalf. Don't compromise when it comes to serving God. And rest assured that God rewards faithfulness. And I'll close with this. When the Twin Towers in New York City fell after 9-11, after the 9-11 attack, there were many theories why the building collapsed the way it did. There's a term that engineers use when describing the strength of steel. It's called integrity. In a lab, engineers will test two pieces of steel that both look alike, and they look great on the outside. But one of them, when it is put under stress, may not support the weight. The reason the other piece of steel holds up under the stress test is because it has what is called integrity. The integrity of the steel is not seen or known until it is tested and put under pressure. We are like those pieces of steel. Our integrity cannot be seen on the outside. You can talk a good talk, but until you are put under pressure and put that talk into action, only then can we see what you're made of because integrity is a quality that's hidden in your heart. I pray that we take these tools that God has revealed to us in this message and hide them in our hearts. So when we are put under pressure, we will not bend. We will not break. We will not give in. Nor will we compromise. But instead, we will stand tall in tough times. May this word bless you today. Amen, amen, amen. Give God some praise, for he is worthy to be praised. Praise God for that message by Minister Brother Andrew Bruce. Such a powerful message, especially in such a time as this, especially in such a time where we are facing tough times, especially in a time where it's easy to take the easy way out. Sometimes it's hard uh, to stand uh, with integrity to not compromise uh, the very thing that uh, was built inside of you. Uh, to stand tall in tough times. It's easy to take the easy way out. And sometimes it's hard to stand tall during tough times. My appeal to you today and my question to you is are you rooted 
in Christ Jesus. What is your integrity? What have you learned throughout your life? Was it taught to you that it's easy to tell a white lie to get away with it? Or should you tell the truth no matter what the consequences are? What kind of integrity do you have? What are you built upon? What is your foundation? See, life will bring trials and tribulations. The Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust just the same. Life happens. But what is your foundation? What is your core values? What is your integrity built upon? Is your foundation on friends and family? Is your foundation on your intellect? Is your foundation on your loved ones? On your mother or your father? When tough times hit, and when trials and tribulations come in your life, do you turn to them or do you turn to Jesus Christ? If you do not know Jesus Christ today, I want to invite you to accept him into your life. Make him your foundation. The Bible says, he said, Lo, I'll be with you always until the end of time. Even though my mother and my father abandon me, the Lord will always be with you. Even though your friends may turn their back on you, even though they may talk about you behind your back, but God will always be for you. Romans 8 said, If God is for me, then who? They'll be against me. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? You are the elect. He has chosen you. He has called you in this very moment. The Bible says, he said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to come inside of your life, inside of your heart and build a foundation that will never break, that has the integrity to stand against trials and tribulations, to have the integrity to stand against all wiles of the enemy. That's what he wants. He wants to give you that integrity through his Holy Spirit. He wants to give you that foundation that you can stand up against any situation in your life we are facing pandemics. People are losing their lives. People are losing their careers. People are losing their relationships. But God is faithful. He is consistent. And he want to be consistent in your life. So if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. It doesn't take much. Paul says in Romans, he said, if you confess with your mouth, and you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins, upon that confession, you are saved. So all I want you to do, wherever you at, I want you to repeat after me this prayer. Heavenly Father God, I come to you as a sinner. I have sinned. I have fallen short of your standard, Lord God. Father, I can't do this without you. Lord, I want you to forgive me of all of my sins that I've committed against you. Father, I want you to come into my heart and into my life and take residence. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to lead and guide and direct me. Father, I am nothing without you. Father, hear this prayer. Take resident in my heart, Lord God. Make me new again in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, and if you have believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and if you confess that, upon that confession, today you are saved. Now, my second appeal is to the one who had a foundation in Christ Jesus, who had roots that were starting to grow 
in the Lord. But some area in your life, something happened. Something took place that caused you to turn away from God. That caused you to uproot the very thing that you was rooted in. You have turned your back on him and you have walked away. Today is the day that I want you to come back. The Bible says that he will leave the 99 to go find the one that is lost. And if you are the one that is lost, he is searching for you in this moment right now. He's not worried about what happened. He's not worried about what's going on in your life in this present moment. He's worried about you. He goes and he finds the one that is lost to bring them back into his fellowship, to bring him back into his family. It's like the prodigal son. The son left because he thought he knew better. He thought he knew what was best for his life. But what he realizes is that he couldn't handle the world on his own. He found himself in the lowest possible position in life. He was sleeping amongst pigs. And he said to himself, even my father's servants are treated better than this. I should go back and ask for forgiveness. And that's what he did. He found himself in the lowest position in his life. He turned himself around. He went back to the father and the father welcomed him with open arms. He didn't question about where he was. He didn't question about what he did with his inheritance. All he did was welcome him back into the family. And they celebrated. They threw a party. And that's what we want to do today. If you find that you have found yourself outside of God's relationship, outside of the foundation, outside of his calling, outside of the very thing that he has called you into, if you find yourself in this position, I want you to know he's welcoming you with open arms in this moment. Don't worry about what you've done. Don't worry about your past. He'll wash it away. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, that he's faithful and just to cleanse you and to forgive you of all of your sins. This is my appeal for the lost. Come back, rededicate your life to God and start anew. Heavenly Father, I pray for these individuals, Lord God. I pray that you find them wherever they are, Lord God. Whatever the trial and tribulation, whatever the depression is, Lord God, whatever the pain is, Lord God, whatever the hurt is, Lord God, whatever the lie the enemy has told them and has said they could do it on their own, but there's no life, there's no faithfulness, there's no love in you. Lord, I come against that lie right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I pray that you press it upon their heart right now, Lord God. Show them that you are welcoming them with open arms, that you love them even though they are yet sinners, son, Lord God, that you sent your son to die for their sins, Lord God. Oh, Father God, let them know that you want them, Lord God, that you desire to have them in your heart right now, Lord God. Touch their heart wherever they are, Father God. Let them know, Lord God, that there are now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no guilty verdict. Oh, God, those old things are passed away, and now they are becoming new, Lord God. Find them, Lord God. Bring them back, Lord God, to your family, to the body of Christ, Lord God, to the church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you have given your life to Christ today, praise God and hallelujah. Oh, God, we give you praise for that moment, Lord God. Oh, the angels, the angels in heaven are celebrating for you giving your life over to Christ Jesus. And if you rededicated your life to Christ, if you have done that, what I want you to do is praise God in this moment right now. Oh, God, those sins, those past things, those past hurts, oh, God, we'll heal those in the name of Jesus, oh, God. Yeah, but if you have dedicated your life to Christ, we would like for you to fill out uh, the welcome card. 
We want to get in contact with you. We want to reach out to you, see how we can serve you as the body of Christ. There's a link in the comment section. Click on that link. Fill out that information uh, with your name, with your uh, address, with your number, and your email so you can stay connected here at Above and Beyond Fellowship. Uh, we want to be a part of your life. We want to help you in this journey that you have committed to in this moment. Fill out that welcome card so we can be a service to you. And also, right now is the time to give. This is the time where we praise God with our tithes and our offering. There are several ways that you can give to this ministry. You can give online at above.org. Um, you can give uh, through text at 74483. And you can also mail in your uh, gift uh, at 20498 Rhodes Road, Spring, Texas, 77388. Uh, now is the time to give your tithes and offering. Uh, the Bible says in, um, in uh, Malachi, he says, how do we rob God? We rob God with our tithes and our offering. And this is the only time that the Lord says, try me in this. He says, try me in this and see that I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not have room to receive. But also he promised that he will protect our finances, protect our harvest from the devourer. Even in this season right now, even though we're facing a pandemic, this is the time that we continue to be faithful with our giving, be faithful with our tithes and our offering, and God will cover you even in a season of lack. Um, also, man, please join us on our prayer line, 630 every morning. It's such a blessing. Uh, me and my wife, we there every morning. Uh, we can't wait to join other believers. Uh, Brother uh, Minister Andrew said that when uh, two or more are gathered that he is present and trust me, there are more than two or three. Uh, sometimes we have over 30 people on this prayer line. We come together, we pray, we ask for people to bring prayer requests, and we touch and agree upon these prayer requests. And even though we have been doing this for several months now, we have seen God move in a mighty way. We have seen children uh, be raised from comas, from diabetic comas. They are home now. We have seen people healed. We have seen people delivered oh god we have seen you move mighty in this prayer line so if you have any concerns if you're anxious about anything meet us 6 30 a.m for prayer also we have uh abf cares school supply drive you still have time to give uh you can give through our website at above.org um we will have this open um until the 16th of august uh, school supply drive will go on through the uh, August the 16th. So please give back to the children for their school. Um, even though they're being home, they still need supplies. Uh, also, for our second time, we are having above and beyond drive-in service. Amen. Man, so, man, the first one we had, it was such a wonderful time. People came out with their lawn chairs. They brought friends and family. We celebrated. We worshiped God together. But well, we did it with social distancing, okay? People wore their masks, it was apart from six feet. But we worshiped God together as a body of Christ. This will take place August the 23rd. Uh, Drive-in church servants will be happening also, and it will be back to school weekend. Uh, so if you please connect with us at above.org, connect with us on all social platforms, Instagram, Facebook, uh, we are here to service you. We are here to be with you uh, even in this time of your life. Thank God. Praise God for Prentice and Andrew. Thank you for such a powerful word that you delivered in such a timely manner. We thank God. Have a blessed weekend and stay blessed and live life above and beyond.